More than a million Australians use cocaine every year. The white powder costs more than gold, but it's a price consumers here are happy to pay. Happier still are the bosses of the drug cartels who are reaping enormous profits. Their riches are growing, despite state and federal law enforcement agencies doing all they can to stop the drugs getting into the country. How the officers go about their work is mostly done in secret. But not always. Tonight, we're taking you inside their battle to outwit the criminals responsible for smuggling massive amounts of illegal narcotics. Sydney's bustling Port Botany is one of the largest container facilities in the country. Ships stream in and out of here 24 hours a day. Today, there's a VIP on the water, the Commissioner of Australian Border Force. In recent times, we've had hundreds of kilos of narcotics found. Michael Outram's come here on a mission to send a message to his greatest enemies, the bosses of the drug cartels. So, Commissioner, we're looking at a pretty big ship with literally thousands of containers on it, but what we can see is only half the problem. Indeed, yeah, the containers are a big problem, but what really worries us today as well is what's under the waterline there. The Commissioner wants to be clear. He and his officers are well aware of the latest devious way drugs are being trafficked into Australia. There are lots of cavities in these ships. Mm -hmm. They're called sea chests and other things, and that's where we're seeing increasingly large quantities of drugs being hidden. It's called parasite smuggling, concealing tons of cocaine and other illegal substances in underwater compartments on the hulls of ships. We can search in a container quite easily. We've been geared up to do that for years. Mm. We haven't been geared up to go under the waterline and examine the bottom of the ship, and it's huge. So we yeah. need to be able to do it in a very expedient way. The rise of parasite smuggling has meant law enforcement has been playing a kind of catch up to drug importers, but not anymore. And Michael Outram wants to show off the reason why. The latest weapon in Border Force's armoury, a fleet of underwater drones. So how long has that drone been in operation for? Just under 12 months. And how many discoveries has it made in that time? We won't go into exactly how many, but in very recent times, it's made a major discovery of you know, more than 100 kilos of narcotics wow. under the waterline on a vessel. That's significant. It's huge. So it's already worth its weight in gold. Absolutely. You took the words out of my mouth. And of course, we have many ports around our 33,000 kilometres of coastline. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to work out how to get more of this sort of technology into more of our ports, because this is a method that criminals are using to bring a lot of narcotics into our country. There's an obvious element of nefarious ingenuity, but parasite smuggling can also be a dangerous game. In May last year, a grim discovery at the port of Newcastle, when the body of 31-year-old Brazilian diver Bruno Borges was found floating in the water. Alongside him was 50 kilos of cocaine, worth $20 million. A failed drug drop has left a scuba diver dead and uncovered a mammoth cocaine haul. Borges had been trying to recover the drugs, which were hidden under a ship when he drowned. You've been doing this for a long time. I have, uh, yeah, straight out of school. Uh, actually joined the Navy uh, as a clearance diver. Yeah. Did that for about eight years um, and then been a commercial diver for the last five years. Professional diver Jared Darcy says the area where Bruno Borges was diving under the ship was particularly dangerous. On the sea chest, you can get sucked against the sea chest. You can get blown off it. Wow. Um, and when you're pinned against the sea chest, the force, there's no way to get off and you will drown. And that's it, game over. That's it. To make the already complicated dive even more perilous, Borges was using a detection avoiding rebreather, which stops air bubbles being emitted. Jared believes the device is a likely contributing factor to his death. So a rebreather is a very technical piece of equipment. Depending on the type of rebreather he was using, uh, if he was Using 100% oxygen rebreather, that does have a depth limitation of about 10 metres. Um, so if he was diving to collect a large quantity of drugs, that would uh, make him uh, a lot heavier in the water mm -hmm. and he could have easily surpassed the 10 metre mark, mm -hmm. which then uh, the dive will go into a blackout. And once you black out underwater, the chance of drowning uh, is quite high. 
these are the risks people are willing to take. Yeah, absolutely. The drug trade, people die. And they've got an immense budget. Um, so whether it's buying, you know, diving equipment with rebreathers, um, flying divers around the world to go and do certain jobs, uh, employing, you know, technologies now to detect our surveillance, um, you know, encryption of communications, uh, incredible sophistication. You know, we've, we're really in a sort of an arms race here and it's constant and we have to keep up with them. Yes, it's impossible to inspect them. Like Michael Outram, Nanette so, Van Shelven uh, is in a battle with parasite smugglers. She's the Director General of Customs in the Netherlands and has been visiting Australia to share intelligence information with Border Force. So, Nanette, how does the port here compare to what you're used to in Rotterdam? I imagine it's much busier where you are. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The, the port of Rotterdam is huge. Nanette's beat includes Europe's largest seaport, Rotterdam. As well as handling 500 million tonnes of legal freight, it's estimated a staggering 50,000 kilograms of cocaine is smuggled through the port every year. The Netherlands has been dubbed the cocaine hub of Europe. Yeah. That's not exactly a title that law enforcement would want. Nope. How does that sit with you? Well, of course, it saddens me. It's not only that we uh, face all those tons of cocaine coming into our harbour, but it's the crime, uh, uh, the crime that also comes with that. The amounts are enormous, but surprisingly, Nanette is confident Dutch Customs is winning the battle to stop the drugs. Through an increase in surveillance, including the use of specialised dive teams targeting parasite smugglers, her officers are seizing more cocaine than ever. A recent study revealed the dent they're putting in the drug cartel's operations. We always thought it would be about 10 or 20 per cent that we stopped and the rest went through. These uh, scientific reports said, no, you are between 50 and 60 to 65 per cent that's being stopped in the harbour of Rotterdam. The Dutch success is something Australian Border Force Commissioner Michael Outram is determined to emulate. But he knows he faces a tough task. We're currently only getting about 20 to 25 per cent of the narcotics getting into our country. So some 80 per cent of drugs are still making their way through to the streets of this Roughly. country? Roughly. Slumped in the seat of his luxury car, executed in an ambush. The cartels might be losing up to a quarter of their product to police operations, but it's a sacrifice they're willing to make. Australia's obsession with cocaine and other illicit drugs guarantees it's still a lucrative trade. It also means there's little likelihood of a truce in Sydney's deadly gang wars. It's the heartache that is left behind that they don't think about. You know, a lot of these funerals that we've done, every time I'm at the cemetery, I always see them. Always see the mother there, you know? Ahmed Harachi is an undertaker at the Lakemba Mosque in Western Sydney. It's sometimes confronting, but he often shares the despair of his job on social media, especially when it's a needless death of a young person. Just take one thing out of this, my brothers. Remember that today you are alive and tomorrow you might be in the back coffin here being taken to the cemetery. In July, the killing of 25-year-old Ahmed Al-Azam was particularly devastating for him. His father came into the washroom and his brother, his only brother. And the father helped wash his son. Think for a second, this is the kid you raised all your life to be a young man. Now you're washing him, he's lifeless. You're bathing him like a baby again, but he's not coming back. He's not a baby, he's dead. Ahmed Al-Azam was shot multiple times as he sat in a car in a suburban street. His family maintain he was an innocent victim of Sydney's drug wars. Ahmed Harachi says their pain is intense. A lot of collateral damage. His dreams will never be reached. He'll never be married. He'll never have offsprings. He'll never have be a grandfather. He'll ne his father will never be a grandfather to his son's kids. The investigation into the murder of Ahmed Al-Azam is ongoing just like the cycle of violence he became a victim of. You know, the people who are actually behind these drug trades are ruthless, violent um, criminals and they're running really evil sort of empires and people are really suffering and some people are dying as a result of it. 
And that's not the only challenge Michael Outram faces. He concedes drug cartels have now compromised every part of the supply chain, from the shipping companies to the port authorities. How widespread is the infiltration, is the corruption within Australia? Within Australia, it's significant. It's a big problem. Um, now, I would say to you that the vast majority of people I deal with in industry, they're doing the right thing. But we've identified in the last two years, um, looking into this problem, about 100 organisations and 1,000 people that operate at the border that really worry us. Really? And that's what we can see. So I mean, That's very disconcerting. It is disconcerting. But it gets worse. The Commissioner's most alarming admission is that he has concerns about some of his own officers. There is no organisation that can lay claim to being corruption free or corruption proof because organised crime need our information. Mm. They want our information. They want to know where we are, when we're going to be there, what we're not looking at, what we are looking at. It's gold for them and we realise the value of that. It is an uncomfortable truth to learn as a member of the public to hear that from, from you, Commissioner, that, that there's likely corruption within your ranks. 99% plus of the workforce are absolutely committed to the mission. I've got 5,700 officers. If just one of those officers, just one, is in the pocket of organised crime and they're in a job where they can access certain sense of information, that's a big problem for us. But ultimately, Michael Outram is an optimist. He's sure the war on drugs will eventually be won by the good guys. Ahmed Harachi hopes the Commissioner is right. Over the past 20 years, he's buried too many victims. His simple wish is for the violence to stop. What impact is the current crime wave having on the community? Honestly, people are moving out. People are selling their houses in these areas and moving out. Why? Because they can't handle it anymore. The devastation, the aftermath, the collateral damage, all left behind, nobody sees that. The story is on the media once, twice, and that's it. No one sees what is left that the family has to pick up the pieces and deal with. We have our wives and our sisters and our siblings all walking in the streets. We don't want a stray bullet to hit one of them. And we've seen, you know, we've heard on the news some of these bullets have gone into childcare centres and stuff like that. Wow, imagine to hit a child, an innocent child. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.